the opening of Cloud Slant by Kenneth Fuchs, played there by the Symphonia of London, conducted by John Wilson, and spectacularly recorded by Shandos in St Augustine's Kilburn in North London on an album just out. I'm James Jolly and welcome to this Gramophone podcast. I caught up with Kenneth Fuchs just before last Christmas, the day after recording sessions, to hear about why, following a series of much-admired recordings with the LSO and Joanne Folletta for Naxos, this new start. This is my sixth orchestral album and my first with John. I mean, a silly question to anybody who knows John Morrison's work or the Symphonia of London, but why them? I mean, what put you together? Well, you know, Joanne and I had a wonderful five volume series with the LSO and that was a remarkable 15 year period in our musical friendship and I think after the fifth album we capped off our recording relationship with the LSO with the Grammy Award for best classical album of the year and and I just felt it was time to do something different and so when John and I first started talking about the possibility of recording together, he was at the point of having had a spectacular run with the John Wilson Orchestra. And at that point, he had just purchased the name of the Symphonia of London and was ready to do something different as well. So we both met at a time where we were ready for a new chapter after having had a wonderfully successful time with what we had done already. You know, when I first encountered John's work. This was about five years ago. I discovered all of his recordings with the John Wilson Orchestra and all of the wonderful recordings of the Hollywood film scores and so forth. But when I heard his Copeland volumes, I knew that I had discovered a truly unique and original interpretive voice. Because I grew up studying and loving the American symphonic composers and knew the body of work of all of those symphonists, not only Copeland and Bernstein, but other names in American music that our generation of listeners may not be so familiar with. Peter Menon, William Schumann, my teacher at Juilliard, Vincent Persichetti and David Diamond, an enormous, Walter Piston, an enormous body of work that these composers created. Each created at least nine symphonies, and in some cases, 10, 11, in the case of Roy Harris, 15. So, you know, when I was in school, I knew that I wanted to learn how to speak that language, but in my own voice. And uh, as a result, knowing that repertoire so well, when I heard John do it, I had never heard it done that way. And I thought, I, I just have to, to get to know this person and, and I hope work with him. And so we started corresponding. At our first dinner, our first meeting here in London, in 2018, my fifth album with the LSO had just gotten the Grammy nomination. And we started talking around the edges of what might be next. And, and so that spring, we won the Grammy. And then the following fall, I was in London again, and John and I had dinner. And I said, you know, John, I'm working on a few pieces that I would like to include on a new recording. And I'm wondering if I could send you. And when I got to that point in the sentence, he said, Ken, I would love to record your next album. And so that's how it happened. And so we talked about repertoire, and I wanted to write a big piece for them, which I did. And that's the concerto for orchestra called Cloud Slant. And it's inspired after three canvases by Helen Frankenthaler, whose work has inspired me for many decades. And it all came together. And I was to come to London in January of 22 when we were scheduled to record the album that was also right at the time of the Omicron outbreak. And it turned out that I was unable to travel. Airports were routed, flights were canceled, and many people were becoming sick. And um, John did not even know if he would be able to proceed with that recording until literally the day before because there might have been still lockdown. And so I attended remotely, but the one thing John said was, I am going to record this album no matter what. And they did. And so here we are on the verge of uh, the release of that first album. And I'm so thrilled. A lot of the members of the, the Symphonia of London play in the LSO, so yes. they were familiar with your Yes, your I knew a, a, number, a number of the players. and. Um, the, the remarkable thing, James, about 
recording here in London with musicians of this caliber, it's it's just a different experience than it is in the, in the U.S. The not only the level of commitment, but but the sense of real joy of what they do and being curious about the music and interested and to watch them work with John and especially to watch the string players the way John works with the strings on sound and what to do to get just the right sound for that musical moment is so inspiring I learned so much and um, watch very closely but it's a great joy to work with British musicians I mean, yesterday's lineup was astounding. I mean, the cello section alone had sort of pr- principal of the Berlin Philharmonic, principal of the Halle Orchestra, people from the Liverpool, people from... I mean, just, you know, you could pluck anyone out of the entire cello section and they could be a soloist. Yes, but, you know, what's so wonderful is that they're all one group together when they're playing, and that, that, that is what is so inspiring. No ego whatsoever. And I'm always happy to have suggestions. Uh, John, the principal cellist, came up to me and had a few suggestions about a few things being arco rather than pizzicato. And, you know, it's such a joy to have that kind of relationship where there's no wall between, between me and, and the orchestra and the players. So, so tell me a little bit about the works on this album. So you, you, the concerto for orchestra you mentioned. Cloud Slant is a large three-movement work, about 20 minutes. It's inspired by three paintings of Helen Frankenthaler, who is such a remarkable figure in the history of American art, particularly abstract expressionism. The first generation of abstract expressionists, Jackson Pollock, Mark Rothko, Willem de Kooning, Robert Motherwell, very forceful and influential group of artists in creating a, a new visual style But Helen came along shortly after in the early 50s and carried that forward with the use of color in the way that they had not. And in fact, Helen invented what is called the soak stain method of painting where she thinned the paint with turpentine and created almost like a a fruit juice kind of texture to uh, the pigment and poured it into the raw canvas so that the paint itself became part of the surface, not just on top of the canvas, but in the canvas. And, and her, her method of working on the floor and, and the, the, the sense of spontaneity that she brought to her work, the large emblematic images, it, it all spoke to me in such a meaningful way when I was a graduate student at Juilliard in the early 80s because I was really struggling to find a way in to the kind of music that I wanted to write. And at that point, you will know, by the end of the 1980s, symphonic composition, certainly in the United States, was in a very different place than it was 10 years earlier, at the beginning of the 80s. David Del Tredici had just created Final Alice. John Adams came along first with Harmonium, and then Harmony Lehrer at the beginning of the 80s and very slowly but quickly over the course of of 10 years composers suddenly realized it was okay to write music that was emotionally direct and tuneful and uh, expressive and, and and when I met Helen at about the same time in 1983 I realized that's what she was trying to do in her work she always said when she finished a painting did I make a beautiful picture and that's the question I asked myself. That's what I wanted to do with my own music. So over the course of my life as a composer, I not only used Helen's approach as a guide, but often would find canvases that really spoke to me visually and that I felt I could do something with musically. Not so much to describe in music what she was doing on the canvas, but to use the method of creating that work as a musical means and how I conceive the music. So the work for John, Cloud Slant, is inspired by three canvases that Helen created in the 1960s in her classic emblematic style. Huge canvases, often nine, ten feet in either direction, and 
big bold images that suggest an emotional state of being and so it's that inspiration how I understand what she did that I want to put into the music so the I decided for John this is my first work for him and the orchestra and I really of course wanted to do something big not for the sake of being big but I knew that I had the opportunity to write for a really great orchestra and for a conductor whom I knew would intuitively understand what I was trying to do musically. And, and presumably course, you didn't have to worry about writing something you think, I wonder if they can play this, because you know that they will be They able can to play, play anything, quite literally. So it was a wonderful creative journey. It was, of course it was inspiring to know that the orchestra and John would be recording the music, but to know that there were really no limits in terms of what I could do. I wasn't trying to write music that was virtuosic just for the sake of being virtuosic, but thinking about the composers who have inspired me, not only the American symphonist, but Ravel, Debussy, thinking about that orchestral sound world, I knew that whatever I conceived of, they would interpret with real truth and understanding. So I decided on this large three movement format to create a work that I've wanted to write for a long time, and that's a, a virtuoso orchestral showpiece, a concerto for orchestra. And that's does that how, set the bar high for other orchestras who might might want to do it? Well, I think it does. I'm working on a, a commission now for an orchestra in the United States, and although I'm writing for them, it's hard not to think about the symphonia at the same time. And um, it sets the bar in a place for me to think about how to conceive the music, but yeah, I think to challenge the next orchestra that I'm writing for, but I think that's the case with, with so many great works in, in contemporary music. I think of the ballets of Stravinsky or several of the great huge works of Ravel. It raises the bar for everybody. And so the other works on the album. So there's Solitary <clears throat> and Thrush. Yeah. Flute is my principal instrument, and I knew at some point that I would write a flute concerto. And when I was a grad student, I encountered Walt Whitman's epic elegy to Abraham Lincoln when lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed. And the three secular symbols that Whitman employs throughout the 17 cantos of those poems are the images of the western orb sailing the heavens, the lilac bush, and the gray-brown bird, solitary the thrush, singing by himself a song, death's outlet song of life. For well, dear brother, if thou was not able to sing, thou would surely die. And when I encountered that, just reading it, I knew that would be the inspiration for my flute concerto someday. And just before I met John, I in fact did receive a commission from an American flutist who admires my music, and I decided the time was right to deal with Whitman and this subject that means so much to me. And I decided to express what Whitman was trying to express in the poem, the bird in the reedy recesses of the swamp that I would use not only the C flute, but the alto flute as the kind of other voice. And so the work is cast in one large movement in four sections. And the first and third sections are a, kind of a, a joyous utterance by the flute, the C flute. And then the, the second and fourth final sections are the ruminative, introspective thoughts or utterances of, of the bird that are expressed by the alto flute. The sentiments of 
death and mortality and even immortality. And um, so I, th I thought it, it seemed right to, to use both instruments to, to try and deal with such a heady idea, both in literature and ultimately in music. And are they both played by the soloist? Yes, yeah. it's, a, it, it's a doubling concerto. So the flutist is playing both the C flute and then, and then the alto flute. And then Pacific Visions. Pacific Visions is a work for string orchestra. It was commissioned by a group in, in Long Beach. And it was for a concert that was devoted to our world around us, the sustenance of our world, the safety continuance of our oceans and the life in the oceans. And they asked me if I would write a, a celebratory work about that for strings and they asked me to title it Pacific Visions, which I was happy to do, and, and on one level, of course, it is about the Pacific Ocean and the mission of the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach where the work was premiered, but I think the larger idea also of Pacific Visions in terms of what it means to live not only a peaceful world, but an integrated world. and. I was trying to get at that in the music as well. I didn't realize quite how virtuosic the piece is for string orchestra until I had the opportunity to work with the Sinfonia of London Strings. They're just a phenomenal group of virtuoso string players, but as I watched John and the players really dig into the piece and to get the sound for each of the sections, it was remarkable to, for me to not only to see but to hear the tone color, the transparency of the textures that they were able to bring out. It's, it's just a remarkable thing because writing for strings, it's, it's a nearly endless sound world of possibilities and it's such a thrill to write for strings. I've always loved doing it. I've written five string quartets and written other works for, for string orchestra, but um, I always love returning to the sound world of the strings because mm. of the possibilities. And John has done that fantastic Metamorphosen oh, album, which you know kind of shows incredible you what can be done. performances. Yes, absolutely. They're, they're geniuses, really, and um, it is such a privilege to work with musicians of this caliber. I feel very lucky, and I am extremely grateful for the opportunity. And when you write a piece of music, right behind the whole process, are you doing it to understand the world we live in it? Or are you doing it to make the world a more beautiful place? Well, for me, musical composition is about, obviously about expression, but a sense of immediacy, of direct expression. And by that I mean I want the person who is experiencing this piece for the first time to understand what it is that I'm saying. And that doesn't mean the piece has to be pretty or sound beautiful all the time, but for me it has to be understandable on the first listening. And of course there will be successive listenings, right? That You want to hear it again, you really want to understand what what the composer is saying, but but I think the first encounter for anybody who doesn't know the piece or who doesn't know my music is to take them on a journey in musical sound that makes sense to them, even if, you know, if they're not a musician. I want them to understand what I'm and saying. you want to change them a bit? I do. 
I think I always have. I remember when I was in, in high school when I was growing up and knew that I wanted to be a composer, I would say things like, I want to write music that has meaning. That's such an amorphous statement, but, but it, it's that sense of creating an understanding and immediacy with the listener that's really important to me. And even if the point is to create a truly unsettling sound world, my work, Falling Man, my 9-11 work, huge work for baritone and orchestra, 18 minutes based on a text by Don DeLillo's post-9-11 novel called Falling Man, it's about the singer is the everyman who is taking us into that place, that moment of the Twin Towers crumbling around him, the chaos, the absolute raw terror that those people were experiencing that morning. There's nothing pretty or beautiful about it, but it would, having been a New Yorker and lived in New York for 20 years of my life, it was important to me to make that, that statement. It's like DeLillo's novel, the music is extremely upsetting, but the journey from the beginning to the end, to the end, to take the listener on the journey through DeLillo's text to a point, I hope, of understanding, if not catharsis, that that happened and we have to understand, either through literature or visual art or music, why it happened and to bring some some sense of understanding to the absolute chaos. And let's talk about the last work, that's <clears throat> Quiet in the Land. Quiet in the Land is a work for full orchestra and it first entered the world as a quintet for mixed instruments for flute, clarinet, viola, cello, and the English horn. And the LSO players, five of the wonderful LSO players, recorded it for my second album with them in 2006. And I remember at the recording session, Paul Silverthorne came over to me and he said, the first time we looked at this combination of instruments, we wondered how in the world could this possibly work? But when they started playing it and recording it, it all fell into place, they understood what I was trying to do with that combination of instruments and and the reason that it works is always you know with a composer it's always about the chord voicing no matter the instrumentation I mean it could be almost any instrumentation but if you use them in, idiomatically in their own world it makes complete sense so that work appeared in 2006 shortly after the US invasion of Iraq and I was thinking a lot about Copeland's Fanfare for the Common Man, which he composed as a wartime fanfare, but as he said, not so much for the troops, but for the people at home. And I was thinking about all of the people in the United States who were left at home, who were sending their, their husbands, their sons, their fathers overseas to fight this battle, and what must it be like for them to send cards and letters and gift packages and so forth and I began to wonder how quiet the spirit of our land might be and that's what I wanted to express in music just as Copeland had done with his fanfare but I wasn't quite finished with that piece I, I thought with the the size of the gesture so to speak that it at some point might require a larger work for orchestra and so when the Phoenix Symphony asked me to write a work for them in 2017, the state of our world, certainly the state of life in the United States, politically and culturally, had deteriorated to such an alarming degree since I had first created Quiet the Land 11 years before. I thought, now's the time to address this in orchestral terms. And I took the original quintet, not I didn't just orchestrate the original quintet, I, I used it as a sketch to create a much larger work for orchestral forces. And John told me when they recorded the piece, I was not here, I was at home due to the Omicron outbreak, but he said it was such an emotional experience for the orchestra to deal with that music and the subtext of what I was trying to express a musical sound that they literally had to stop and 
take breaks, to take a deep breath, to collect themselves, but also to really understand what I was trying to say musically. And I have to tell you, when I heard the first rough edit, I was so blown away by the, the intensity of what they created in musical sound. I, I, I really burst, <laughs> I burst into tears when I heard it. And I'm so excited that this work is, is on the album and I can't wait for our listeners to hear it because I, I think it's a very special piece, not just because I wrote it, but I hope it addresses in musical sound the truly desperate situation that we are living in, in this world. Did you retain any of the kind of the colour from a quintet? Because it's an unusual lineup of instruments. I did. And, you know, thinking again about Copeland and what that sound world means to me, there's always the sense of distance, of space, of a very large depth from top to bottom. I always experienced that with Copeland and you know thinking about the geographical range of the United States from the the citified coasts to the great midwestern plains that is the sense of space and distance that I wanted to create in the music first in the quintet and in a way it was almost easier with only five instruments to do that when you have a full orchestra you had to be very careful about not only the sense of space in the in the orchestral writing in terms of the texture and the chord voicings and so forth, but how to use the resources of a full symphony orchestra to express the depth, the distance, the sense of emptiness, of loneliness. Also the, the feeling, uh, the overpowering sense of, of helplessness that I think so many people in our world experience now. But it was easier, I think, to express that with the full resources of a symphony orchestra. Part of Quiet in the Land by Kenneth Fuchs. John Wilson conducted the Symphonia of London and the solo flautist in Solitary, the Thrush, was Adam Walker. And that Shandos release is just out. And a second one on the way. Talking of fine orchestras, Gramophone's hunt for its 2023 Orchestra of the Year is underway. Just head over to gramophone.co.uk slash awards to see the 10 shortlisted ensembles. You can also listen to the 10 specially curated playlists on Apple Music Classical and vote for your favourite orchestra. The result will be revealed on October the 4th. Gramophone podcasts are free, but if you enjoy them, then a really great way to support our work is to take out a subscription to Gramophone magazine. Over 13 issues a year, we bring you hundreds of reviews by our expert critics, as well as in-depth articles about the latest classical music releases and the most exciting musicians of the day. And if you head over to gramophone.co.uk slash subscribe and enter the code PODCAST20 in the checkout, you can even get a 20% discount off any subscription package. We really value your support. And do consider leaving a review or rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. And do look out for another Gramophone podcast very soon.